Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com, without the beard, and welcome to episode 32 of my video train blog series. Okay, so what I want to do in this episode today is show you some examples of weathering that I've done to my trains recently and over the last few years, and also talk about some of the techniques that I like to use to weather my trains. Now, before I start, there are a few things I want to go over. First of all, in this episode, I'm not going to be going into a lot of detail about how to do the weathering. Teaching you how to do weathering, especially using an airbrush like I like to do, takes a lot of time, and so a full tutorial on weathering is something I'll probably have to put out a DVD about because that takes a couple hours to explain properly. What I want to do here is just give you a quick overview of some of the weathering techniques that I use, and then hopefully this will inspire you to do some research on your end and learn more about it. Secondly, I want to emphasize that I am not an expert when it comes to weathering. There are certainly lots of other people out there that are far better at it than I am. I think I'm pretty good and I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at right now, but there's a lot of stuff I still don't know how to do. I'm still learning and I'm still developing my weathering skills. My skills are always evolving and changing. So the weathering techniques I use now are different from the techniques I used a few years ago and different from what I'll use a few years from now. A perfect example of that is that if you look on my YouTube channel, you'll see a video that I made three or four years ago on weathering where I weathered a car using nothing but powders. And that's kind of obsolete now because my technique has changed so much that it's completely different from what I did back then. So it's an ever evolving process. The way you weather trains will always be evolving and you'll always be improving your technique. Another thing is that I want to emphasize that the methods and techniques that I use are not the only methods out there. The techniques I use work for me, but they may not work for you. So don't think that the stuff I'm about to show you is the way it must be done. There are no rules. You can use whatever methods you like. It's all about what works for you personally. So hopefully when I show you this stuff, it'll get you thinking and then you can go off on your own and find what works for you. The last thing I want to do before we get started is to make a reading recommendation. There's a book I got a few years ago called Weathering by Tom Mann, and this book has been an invaluable resource to me over the years when it comes to weathering my trains. This book is always on my desk within reach because I'm always going back to it and referencing the techniques that he uses in the book. It's a fantastic read and I highly recommend it. And actually, I recommend getting your hands on as many books and DVDs about weathering as you can because the more material you can absorb, the better you'll be at weathering your own trains. But if I had to recommend one book, this would be it. It's absolutely fantastic, and I strongly recommend it. It's not expensive. It's an easy read. Trust me, if you're serious about weathering your trains, get this book first. Although there are many different techniques for weathering trains, for me, right now at this point in time, there are generally three techniques that I like to use. Those are the airbrush, oil washes, and then chalks and powders. Now, there are other techniques that I'm still working on that I'm still developing my skills with, but I don't use them on my trains yet because I don't feel I'm good enough at them yet to use them on an expensive model. So right now, I use the airbrush, the oil washes, and the chalks and powders for the most part. Now, that doesn't mean I use all three methods on every model. I will mix and match those depending on what I feel is appropriate for each model. But by far, the most dominant method that I use is the airbrush. On any given weathered model that you see, it's probably 90% airbrush, 5% oil washes, and 5% chalks and powders. This is the airbrush that I use to weather my trains. The brand on this airbrush is Iwata, and the model is an Eclipse HPCS. I bought this a few years ago, and I believe it cost around $140 or so, and it's a good quality precision airbrush. And in fact, the reason that I got this was because in that book that I just recommended to you a minute ago, Weathering by Tom Mann, this is the kind of airbrush that he uses. And so I figured if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me, and I have not been disappointed. This is a quality airbrush that delivers consistent results time after time. Now, you can spend a lot less than $140 on an airbrush. They make $30 airbrushes, but I wouldn't recommend getting one because if you get a cheap airbrush, you're going to get cheap results. Just like anything else in life, you get what you pay for, and if you want good, consistent results, you need to get a good quality airbrush and a good quality air compressor. Now, the compressor that I use is also made by Iwata, 
It's a basic compressor, but it does have a pressure gauge, which allows me to regulate the pressure in the line because you want between 30 and 40 PSI when you're airbrushing. I like to have about 35 personally. So as long as you have a good quality air compressor and a good quality airbrush, you'll get consistent results that you won't necessarily get with a cheaper airbrush. And while $140 may seem like a lot of money, it's really a one-time expense because if you take care of it, an airbrush can last a lifetime. There are some parts that do need to be replaced from time to time, like the needle and the nozzle and so forth, but those are inexpensive. If you take care of the airbrush itself, it'll last a long, long time. Now, there are two features about this airbrush that I like. One thing is that it's gravity-fed, and that means that the color cup up here where the paint goes is on top, and the paint is fed into the airline by gravity. That's opposed to a suction airbrush where the color cup is down below and the paint gets sucked up into the airline. Now, which one you like really depends on personal preference, but I just like the gravity-fed ones, and most people who weather their trains with an airbrush use gravity-fed airbrushes. The other thing I like about it is that it's double action, and that refers to the handle back here, the trigger. And that means that you've got two actions. You've got up and down and then back like that. When you press it up and down like this, this turns the air on and off. So when I press it down, if I had it hooked up to my air compressor right now, clean, dry air would shoot out of the front. No paint, just air. And then as you pull the handle back, it mixes in the paint to the strength that you want. So the double action airbrush gives you a lot more precision control over the amount of paint that's coming out of the front of the airbrush, as opposed to a single action airbrush where you don't really have as much control. It's just on or off and you can't control the amount of paint coming out. Now most cheap airbrushes, once again, they'll have the single action instead of the double action. And that's why, again, I recommend getting a quality airbrush because they'll have double action and that allows you to have much more precision control of what's coming out of the airbrush. Of course, Iwata is not the only brand of airbrushes and air compressors on the market. There are lots of different brands and lots of different configurations, and ultimately what you decide to go with is going to be a personal choice. But as for me, I like the Iwata brand, and I have no reason to change it. Now, in terms of what you should plan on spending, you know, as I said, there are really cheap airbrushes that you can get for $30. There are also really fancy ones that can go for three or $400. I would stay away from either extreme and go right down the middle. A good solid airbrush is going to cost you between one and two hundred dollars. And of course, I recommend getting one that is gravity fed and double action. When it comes to buying an air compressor to go with your airbrush, again, there are lots of different brands on the market and they're all fine. What you want to look for in an air compressor, no matter what brand you buy, is one that is capable of delivering about 40 PSI and one that has a pressure gauge and a pressure adjusting valve so that you can fine tune the pressure. In terms of price, you can get a really cheap air compressor for $30. I would stay away from those. And you can also get a really expensive one for several thousand dollars. I would stay away from those. A good air compressor for airbrush weathering is going to run you between $120 and $250. The air compressor that I have is the Iwata Silver Jet, and it cost me $150. The last piece of airbrush equipment that I want to talk about here goes between the air compressor and the airbrush, and it's called a moisture trap. A moisture trap is a device which removes water from the air so that you don't get water in the airline in the airbrush itself, because if you get water in here, it'll spatter out the front and ruin a perfectly good weathering job. You want to have clean, dry air going through your airbrush, and the moisture trap makes that happen. Now, on some really nice air compressors, they already have a moisture trap built in. But if they don't, you can add one in line between the compressor and the airbrush. When it comes to Iwata, they make a little device right here that's called the pistol grip air filter. And it attaches to the airbrush itself like that. And then you hold it like that. And this chamber collects the water out of the air. And then it's got a purge valve here for when it gets full. And that ensures that you have clean, dry air in the airbrush mixing with the paint. Let's talk about paint. There are generally two types of paint that can be used for airbrush weathering, water-based paints and solvent-based paints. I've got examples of both types of paint here, so let's take a quick look at each. Here's a water-based paint. This is a popular brand for weathering trains. It's called Polyscale and it's made by testers. Polyscale has a whole series of colors available just for making things look dirty, and it's a very high quality water-based paint. 
The water-based paints have the advantage of being safe and non-toxic. And by that, I mean that when you airbrush with water-based paints, there are no harmful fumes, and when it's time to clean up, all you need is some warm, soapy water. These two bottles here are examples of solvent-based paints. This is a popular brand called Floquil Railroad Colors, and it's made by Testers, the same company that makes the Polyscale brand. And this is a brand called Scale Coat, which is made by Weaver Models. There are two different types of Scale Coat paint, Scale Coat 1 and Scale Coat 2. For airbrush weathering, you want to use Scale Coat 2. And in fact, Weaver makes a six-pack of weathering colors that you can pick up for about $20.00. And it includes the six most commonly used colors you need to weather trains. They've got a black, they've got a sand color, a dirt color, two different types of grime coloration, and a rust color. Solvent-based paints are what most train manufacturers use to paint the trains at the factory. So, for example, when this Burlington Northern car was painted green at the factory over in China, they used solvent-based paints. So, weathering with solvent-based paints works very well on the factory coat. In fact, Weaver Models actually uses this same brand of paint to paint all of their models. So, this is professional-grade paint here. Unlike the water-based paints, however, the solvent-based paints do contain toxic chemicals and they will produce toxic fumes when sprayed from an airbrush. And for that reason, you always have to wear a respirator and you also want to either use a fan-equipped paint booth or at least use the airbrush in a well-ventilated area. Basically, you would use the same precautions with the solvent-based paints that you would use for spray paint because it's basically the same thing. Now, it's not toxic once it dries on the model. It's not like it contains lead. You don't have to worry about that. It's just that when you're applying the paint, you have to be careful that you don't breathe the fumes in. Now, as far as what type and brand of paint that I like to use, I personally prefer to use the Scale Coat solvent-based paints. I've used both water-based paints and solvent-based paints, and I've experimented with different brands. And for me, I like the consistency of the results that I get with the solvent-based Scale Coat paints. But again, that's just me. In the end, whichever type and brand you decide to use, it's going to come down to your personal preference. If you're new to this, what I would recommend is for you to experiment with both the water-based paints and the solvent-based paints, and experiment with different brands, and then decide for yourself which type and brand you feel most comfortable with. There's no wrong choice. It's all about what you feel works best for you. And, of course, there's no reason you can't use multiple brands and multiple types of paint. Regardless of whether you use the water-based paints or the solvent-based paints or both, you always need to thin the paint before it goes into the airbrush because the paint out of the bottle is too thick to go into the airbrush. With the water-based paints, you're going to thin the paints with distilled water. With the solvent-based paints, you're going to thin them with mineral spirits. Now, when I thin my paints, I like to have about a 60-40 ratio. That means about 60% paint and 40% thinner. So for the water-based paints, it's going to be about 40% water. And with the solvent-based paints, it's going to be about 40% mineral spirits. It's always better to err on the side of the paint being too thin because if it's too thin... At the very worst, you'll just have to do a few more coats of the paint. But if it's too thick, that can be a disaster. At the very least, it may clog up the airbrush and, and make the airbrush inoperable. But at worst, it could cause globs of paint to spatter out of the front of the airbrush and completely ruin your weathering job. Okay, so moving on from the airbrush, the next technique that I like to use to weather my trains is oil washes. I've got two tubes of oil paint here. These are the two colors that I use most frequently. This is Burnt Umber, and this is Ivory Black, and the brand on these is Windsor & Newton, and you can pick these up in any good art supply store. What you do is you take a little bit of the oil paint and you mix it with water to create a really thin wash, and then you apply that wash to the model with a big, thick brush. And what it does, in the case of the black, it'll gather around the cast-in details on the model and give the illusion of depth and shadows. And then for the Burnt Umber, that's used more for rust effects, you can put that on the side of a model and it gives the look of rust washing down the car or the engine over time. Now what I like to do for the black, I like to use this on engines because it'll gather up around the latches and the hinges and the vents and so forth and just give a really gritty look to the engine. It makes it look very realistic. Now, it should be noted that the application of the oil washes is never the first step in weathering a model. I always airbrush the model first. And the reason is because if you try to put an oil wash on a brand new model that hasn't been weathered yet, it'll just beat up and run down the side of the car. If you don't believe me, try taking a paintbrush and dipping it in just plain water, no oil, just water, and put it on a car and watch what happens. It'll just beat up and run down the side because 
it has nothing to grab onto. That's why you have to airbrush it first. Once you've airbrushed the car, that gives the oil wash something to grab onto. It gives the car some bite and therefore it'll look much better. Now, one of the nice things about using the oil washes is that because they're made of oil, oil takes a long time to dry. So you can put an oil wash on and then come back a few hours later or even a few days later and make changes to it. So if you've noticed that it hasn't dried the way you wanted it, if it's got some splotches or something like that, you can just wet a brush and just redo it until it's exactly the way you like. So they're very flexible like that. The last technique that I use to weather my trains, for now at least, is the use of chalks and powders. These are the powders that I use. These are weathering powders that you can buy from Bragdon Enterprises. And as you can see, they come in a variety of different colors. And what you do is you take a dry brush and you get a little bit of the powder on the brush and you apply it to the car. Now, back in the day, several years ago, when these were the only things that I used to weather my trains, I would put a lot of this powder on the cars, but... I didn't really like the way it looked. I thought it looked a little amateurish, and so that's why I eventually moved to using the airbrush for the overall look of the car. Now, I use these powders for little accents on the cars and engines. So I'll put a little down on the trucks for some rust. I'll use black to give some wear and tear to the ladders and grab irons and brake wheels. And I'll use the blacks and grays and browns to do some smudges and other small accent dirt and stuff like that. Just little accents here and there to give the car or engine a little more of a well-used look. I also use chalks to weather my trains. These are the chalks that I use. The brand is called Alpha Color, and I think I got these at an art supply store somewhere. I've got two packages. This one has a spectrum of yellows and oranges and reds and browns and blacks. And then this one has a spectrum of whites and grays and blacks. And I use these just like the powders, just to give little accents to the cars and the engines. And they're also good for weathering the ties on my track. What you basically do is just scrape a little off and get it on a Q-tip or a brush, and then apply it to the car or the engine or the ties on the track. Okay, so now that I've shown you the techniques that I use to weather my trains right now, I'm going to show you some examples of trains that I've weathered recently and over the last couple years. And then after that, we'll discuss some additional techniques that I'm not using yet on my trains, but that I'm planning on using in the future once I perfect them to the point where I can add them to my arsenal. Okay, up first is the car you've been staring at for the last few minutes. This is a Burlington Northern Hopper that's made by Atlas. And I weathered this car about two or three weeks ago. The main component used to weather this car was the airbrush, of course. And then I also used some of the weathering powders. I did not use any of the oil washes on this car. Why didn't I? Well, I just didn't feel like it. So with the airbrush, I gave a good fade to the car. And I also used some blacks and dirt colors to give some dirt around the tires and dirty up the Burlington Northern logo a little bit. And then I came in with the powders and did a little accent work. I added some rust to the trucks and the brake chain up here. And then I used some black to give some wear and tear to the ladders and grab irons and the brake wheel and the platform and also the walkway up on top. This car is a good example of how I like to use the airbrush. The airbrush is not meant to make a car look disgusting and trashed. Its purpose is to make the car look well used like it's been in service for a while. So if you look at this car, the car itself is in good shape. It's just dusty and faded. And that's what I was going for. I wasn't trying to make this car look trashed. If you want to make a car look trashed, you have to use rust effects and dings and dents and scratches. That's a whole different animal, and it's actually something that I'm not very good at yet. That's why I don't do it on most of my cars right now. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes, but as far as the airbrush goes, its purpose is not to trash the car, but just to make the car look well used. Here's another Atlas car that I've weathered recently. This is a CSX steel coil car. And it's a little bit more of a challenge to weather a car like this than a boxcar or a hopper because it's not flat. It's got curved sides to it. You know, if you're new to weathering, the best thing to do is start off with boxcars and hoppers because they have big flat surfaces that make it easy to learn on. Doing tank cars or coil cars like this is a little more difficult and takes a little more experience to do them right. But anyway, uh, the techniques used on this car are the same as the last car. I use the airbrush to give it a good fade and a good dusty look and then I use the powders to put some rust on the trucks and then some wear and tear on the paint on the walkways here so overall I think it looks pretty good 
Here's an engine that I've weathered. This is also made by Atlas. It's a Conrail MP15 DC switcher. And this model utilizes all three weathering techniques that I'm using right now. I first hit it with the airbrush to give it a dusty, dirty, faded look. Then I came back with a black oil wash to add a little depth and give it more of a gritty look. And then I finished it off with some powders to put some dirt on the handrails and the walkways and the smokestacks and so forth. And I think overall it looks pretty good. I want to use this engine to make a couple points. First of all, you don't have to do your weathering all at once. Don't feel rushed when you're weathering something. This engine has been weathered in several weathering sessions over a period of about two years. About two years ago, I did the first weathering where I came at it with the airbrush, and then I did some powder work. And then about six weeks ago, I came back to this model and I put the black oil wash on. I did some touch-up work with the airbrush and then I added some more powder work to it. So don't feel like you have to do it all at once. And this is especially true if you're still developing your skills. You can weather something and then come back to it a year or two later when your weathering skills have improved and make it that much better. Don't feel rushed. You can do it at your own pace. The other thing I want to point out is that the amount of weathering that I do on an engine really depends on the road name and the type of engine, and this engine is a perfect example. This is a Conrail switcher, so it's going to get a heavy weathering for two reasons. First of all, it's Conrail. Conrail hasn't been around for a while now, so anything you see on the rails today with Conrail on it is usually going to be in pretty bad shape because it hasn't had a good paint job in probably 15 or 20 years. So the fact that this is Conrail means I can kind of let loose on it and make it as dirty as I want. The other thing is that this is a switcher, and switchers are often in much worse shape than the road engines because they're in the yard. Nobody really cares if they look brand new or not, so switchers, especially older switchers like this, are going to be really beat up. So whenever I get a switcher like this, I kind of feel free to go to town on it and make it as dirty and as beat up as I want. Now in contrast to that, the road engines are a different story. You know, on the road, when you see a UP engine or a Norfolk Southern engine or a BNSF engine, generally they're in pretty good shape because those are class one railroads. They clean and wash those engines. They give them paint jobs on a regular basis. And so generally you might see a little dust and dirt on them, but they're gonna be in pretty good shape. But again, if you see something like Conrail or some other road name that's defunct, it's gonna be in much worse shape. And so I try to reflect that when I weather my models. And this sort of leads to a question that I'm asked quite a bit. A lot of people ask me, Eric, are you going to weather every train in your fleet? The answer is no, and there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, I personally don't think it's realistic to have everything be weathered. Because if you go out on the real railroads, some stuff looks brand new and some stuff looks really old. When it comes to engines, you know, if you see a BNSF ES44 coming down the main line, chances are it's going to be in pretty good shape. On the other hand, if you see a Conrail Dash 9 coming down the line, it's going to be pretty beat up. And the same goes for freight cars. And so I want to reflect that on my layout. I want some stuff to be really weathered and beat up and some stuff to look brand new. The other reason that I don't want to weather everything in my fleet is because, quite frankly, I don't have the nerve to weather everything in my fleet. For example, my Lionel Vision Line engines. They're just really special to me. They're really expensive. And so I don't ever see myself weathering those engines. And steam engines. Right now, I have not yet weathered a steam engine because they're just so expensive and beautiful. I'm almost scared to weather them. Now, I will probably weather a steam engine at some point in time, but I won't weather all of them because I just think they're too beautiful to weather. But that's just my opinion. But, you know, that's the great thing about this hobby. If you don't want to weather anything in your fleet, that's fine. If you want to weather everything, that's fine. And if you're somewhere in the middle like me, that's fine too. That's the great thing. It's all about what you want. There is no wrong choice. Here's a boxcar. This is a high cube boxcar made by MTH. And I weathered this a couple years ago, and it's actually one of my favorite weathering jobs that I've done on a freight car. Everything just seemed to come together right. It's mostly airbrush with just a little bit of powders thrown in for good measure. I use the airbrush to give it a faded, dusty, dirty look. I also use the airbrush to do some dirt flare-ups around the trucks. And then I use powders to give some wear and tear to the grab irons and the ladders and the brake wheel and so forth. And it just turned out really good. You know, Normally, you're your own worst critic. You tend to see the things you did wrong when you look at your own work. But when I look at this car, I actually say to myself, hey, that's pretty good. I did a pretty good job there. I sort of hinted at this earlier, but the color and type of model that you're trying to weather have a lot to do with how easy or difficult a weathering job is going to be. 
So like I said before, if you're just starting off, it's best to start with cars that have a big flat canvas like box cars and hoppers because they have big flat sides that are easy to work with as opposed to tank cars which are much more difficult to work with because of the curved sides. Well the same goes for color. Some colors are easier to weather than others. So for me, greens and browns and blacks have always been easy to weather but on the other side of the spectrum, white is a very difficult color to weather. So again, if you're just starting off, I would recommend starting with darker colors like browns and greens and blacks, and then wait until you've gotten good with those before you move on to lighter colors like white. Here's a coal hopper. This one is made by MTH. Coal hoppers are actually my favorite cars to weather because they're the easiest cars for me to weather. I can pretty much weather these things in my sleep now because I've done so many of them. I use the airbrush on them and then I use powders. I don't use any oil washes just because that's the way I like to do it. I think it looks pretty good and again I've done a whole bunch of these so let's take a look at a couple more. Here's another coal hopper. This is also made by MTH. In fact, it's identical to the one you just saw. It's just a different road number. This actually came from the same six pack of coal hoppers as the other one. With this one, I weathered it just a little bit differently. I wanted it to look a little newer than the other one. So down toward the bottom, it's kind of dirty, but as it gets towards the top, it's a little cleaner than the previous car. Here's another MTH coal hopper. This is a different road name. The road name on this is AEPX. And this is another one of my favorites. It looks really good. And the reason it looks good is, again, because of color. It's got black and silver and yellow. All three of those colors take weathering really well. And so it was a lot of fun to make this thing look dirty and disgusting. Not trashed, but just well used. Here's a Conrail Dash 8 made by MTH. And again, because it's Conrail, when I bought this model, I knew almost immediately that I was going to weather it. I think it looks pretty good. It's mostly airbrush and then just a little powder on the trucks and couplers and handrails and so forth. At some point in the future, I will probably revisit this model and add a black oil wash to give it some more grittiness. And then also at some point in the future, I'd like to add some rust and some peeling paint. But I'll talk more about rust and peeling paint in just a few minutes. Here's a Pan Am box car, also made by MTH. The techniques that I used to weather this car were pretty much the same as the other cars I've shown you. It's mostly airbrush with just a little bit of powders. But the reason I wanted to show you this car was so that you could compare it to a car that has not been weathered. So here's the weathered Pan Am box car, and then here is an identical Pan Am box car that has not been weathered. And you can see there's quite a difference. You know, when you see the car by itself, you may say, well, that's not too dirty. But when you see them side by side, you can see that the difference is really quite remarkable. Here's the last fully weathered model I want to show you today. This is a Lionel model. This is an Alco C420 diesel. I weathered this about a month ago, so it's a fairly recent weathering. Because it's seaboard, it's a railroad that's not around anymore, I felt free to make it pretty dirty. So I used the airbrush to give the initial coat. Then I came back with the black oil wash, and then I touched up with some powders. Okay, so now that I've shown you some examples of the three weathering techniques that I'm using these days, let's talk about some techniques that I'm not using. There are several techniques that I don't use on my fleet yet because I'm still developing them. I'm still trying to get good enough at them before I use them on expensive engines and cars. Most of those techniques involve the application of rust and peeling paint and other damage to the car like scrapes and dings and gouges and so forth. And so what you're looking at here is a test car that I have. This is a CNO box car that's made by MTH. And a few years ago, I think it fell off a table or something and it broke a couple of grab irons and ladders. And so I decided to use it as a test bed for new weathering techniques. And so if you look on this car, you'll see the application of some rust. There's some scrapes that I did a few weeks ago and some streaking of rust. It doesn't look very good, but that's because this is a test car. I'm just testing these techniques, trying to perfect them until I get them to a point where I'm comfortable enough to apply them to other cars and engines in my fleet. Now, when it comes to rust and peeling paint and car damage, there are several techniques you can use, and I'm trying to develop a lot of those techniques. One of those techniques is salt weathering, where you use sea salt to put a rust effect on a car. Another one is using an X-Acto knife to put gouges in the car and then streaking rust down from those gouges. Another one involves the use of sponges to do rust. You can also use certain chemicals to create real rust on a car. So there's all sorts of techniques for doing damage to a car. And that's what I'm working on these days. So this is my test bed. This is where I perfect these techniques until I'm comfortable enough to use them on the rest of my fleet. 
Now, if you recall earlier, I said that you don't need to be in a hurry to weather a car or an engine. You can do it over a period of time. Well, this is a perfect example of that. There are lots of techniques that I'm working on with this test car that I haven't used on my fleet yet. But when I get good enough with these techniques to where I feel I can use them on my fleet, I'll go back to some of those cars and engines that you just saw and apply some of these techniques. So those Conrail engines, for instance, once I get good enough at these damage techniques, I'll go back and put some rust and some peeling paint and so forth on those Conrail engines and make them look that much better. Okay, that about wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, don't think of me as an expert in weathering. I am not an expert. There is plenty of stuff that I don't know about weathering trains. And it's likely that a couple years from now, I'll probably look back at the models that I just showed you and say, yeah, I think I can do better. And I'll go back and improve on those models. So it's an ever-changing process. You're always improving. You're always learning. So everything I said and showed you in this video, don't take it as fact. That's just the way that I like to do it right now. You don't have to do it that way. My goal is just to inspire you to go out there and try these things and experiment and find something that works for you. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time.